So there you go, your night's been recorded. Cool. So um, welcome to those who um, haven't met Tom and myself before. I'm Jo Sheridan, the demonstration manager, and uh, Tom Buckley, who is the farm manager at our farm. Um, with us today, we've got a couple of key people on, on our team. Uh, Frank Portergeis, who is part of our farm management committee. And we've also got uh, Neville Cook, uh, sorry, Frank's from DNZ, and also Neville Cook from LIC, who's uh, one of our our valued uh, partners in relation to our mating plans. So uh, there's a, a few of you um, sort of joining in today, which is great. We wanted to be able to keep the session as interactive as possible. And we thought we'd just start off by having just a quick roundup of the week that has been, and then we would start to delve into um, the, the key topic, which was chosen as our mating plan for um, our principal lives for calves target. So, um, Tom, we just did a farm walk yesterday, covers have dropped, growth rate slowing, but uh, we've pretty much taken the training wheels off and it's all go from here, isn't it? Yep. yep. <laughs> no, I, I, you say it's dropped, but um, we were just over 2200 the week before, so 2150 I think yesterday, so I'm pretty, pretty happy with that. Um, when the sun was shining, it was um, lovely, but a um, bit of end and a um, bit of rain, perfect really. Right. <clears throat> and so, uh, what, seven cows to calf, you're pretty much firmly focused on mating now? Four, four cows to calf. Oh, four cows. Well done. Yeah. <laughs> 40% of them calf last night. So. <laughs> Big day. Yeah. Yeah. Um, um, yeah, so yeah. Concentrating on um, mating, really, or having a rest before mating starts. And, um, yeah, I was going to paint yesterday, but it was raining during milking, so I'll probably do that this afternoon and then have tomorrow off. Okay, excellent. So just to provide a little bit of context, oh, do, any questions about some of the weekly data before we go into the, the mating plan stuff? No? Okay, so um, I was just going to start sharing my screen uh, to talk about some of the the Alpha KPIs, in particular, one of our um, dreams, which is around 100% purposeful lives for calves. And just to give a bit of context, uh, our farm is owned by St. Peter's School in Cambridge. And as one of our stakeholders, they had asked us to progress along the lines of having a, a purposeful breeding objective for every calf. So that meant a calf that was um, adding value um, and was bred for a certain purpose, not just to, to get a cow back and calf for the next season. And so we've been traveling along a journey for the last couple of years around how do we provide a calf that is of value to either the deer industry or to the beef market um, that meets the needs of our wider, of our stakeholders and of our wider community. And so for the last uh, couple of years, um, we have progressed along that journey. Now I'll just check that that is sharing. Um, are you seeing a little uh, elk yep. farm calf summary? Yep. Yep. A, a bar graph, a matchstick graph. So effectively what we've got is um, on the right hand side, 2018, to 2019 and 2020 and 2021. So we've just recently loaded up the 2021 data. Um, the key thing really is that we've moved from about 34% purposeful breeding objectives up to about 71% over the last sort of three years. Uh, and there's uh, the first year that we did um, all AI, was it the 2018 year, Tom? Yeah, so we went, we were doing all AI on farm uh, for a variety of reasons, um, health and safety, uh, bit of genetics, all that sort of stuff. And then we started to progress along the journey of putting Wagyu's. Because we were able to make every cow with a selected semen straw, we started to explore the opportunity of how we could use different beef, beef breeds to be able to um, get more value from those calves. So the journey sort of started in the um, 2019 uh, mating for the 2020 carving and you can start to see in that 2020 year uh, the reduction that we had in the, the bobby calf numbers and the increase that we had in the wagyu and the um, the sort of beef breeds. The 2020 year was a year that we actually had quite a lot of surplus heifer calves. Uh, we had 33 of them that were sold. Uh, the herd is about top 6% BW nationally and so we do have a bit of a market for those heifer calves. Um, this year just Due to the way the stores were selected, we had about 13 that we sold for about a dollar twenty per BW, weren't they, Tom? Yeah. Uh, for for this year, 
So this is um, sort of the trajectory that we've sort of been be moving on. So, uh, Tom, do you just want to talk a little bit about, um, and Neville, you can jump in at any time as well, about uh, why why we've sort of continued on this this mix and what have been some of the pros and cons of uh, increasing the, the Wagyu content of the breeding strategy uh, in an attempt to, to continue to reduce the bobbies? Um, well, obviously, we, we um, were asked to reduce bobby numbers. So, um, you know, worked with LIC and came up with a plan to use Wagyu. Um, the good thing with Wagyu is you've got a guaranteed price, um, whether it's heifer or bull, um, and they, yeah, they'll pick up regularly. So it's, it's pretty good. Um, rather, and we don't you know, have to create a mob and then take them to a sale or anything. And you never know what you're going to get at the sale. So um, it has worked really well. Um, we've reared a, a lot more this year. Um, and yeah, we've got, um, I think you said the other week, 219 bucks a, a calf. So uh, much better than um, most of the beef breeds that are going to the sale. So it's pretty handy. Cool. In terms um, of rating the uh, yearlings, uh, I guess is, is a uh, significant co contributor to how you reduce the uh, the bobbies. The fact that you, ha you haven't got too many options with the ye your, your yearlings or uh, in calf heifers, and um, so by moving to to maiden to get a replacement, you're getting better quality replacement, but you're also straight away reducing the, the opportunity to get bobbies from that group. And the, and, and the, the options that for our farm have been to increase the number of wagyu straws. And in, in the herd, so it's a little bit of a trade-off there, which has helped that process. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good point, Neville. And so um, this year, Tom, uh, going to continue. Were you happy with the the heifer synchrony sex semen part of the contribution for this year? Were you? Is it? Yeah, I think the um, the heifer synchrony went really well. I haven't worked out what the percentage or the conception rate for the sex was, but uh, I think the synchrony was 52% um, in calf. Um, we didn't have them date, dated when we scanned them, but um, off the calving events, um, I think it worked really well. A um, lot, of, lot of heifers carved up front uh, before the cows started. Um, and yeah, as soon as the cow started calving, we were able to send milk a lot earlier. And I think that the heifers quietened down a lot, lot quicker. Um, and yeah, they've been they've been a real dream to handle um, this spring. Um, and yeah, we heard tested yesterday, so I'm just waiting to see how how well they're milking. Yeah. And so only changes to the heifer synchrony program this year, coming year is around potentially bull power following that synchrony program, Tom? Yeah. Is that identified yeah. as a bit of a challenge? Um, yeah, potentially we didn't have enough bull power last year for the for the condensed returns having synchronised the first um, insemination. So, um, yeah, we've asked, asked the grazier to put an extra bull in. Um, we have, because... The, um, they didn't go so well during June. Um, the graziers actually split the mob up um, to two different farms now. So we're doing a split synchrony on the two mobs. Um, and yeah, so that, that should share the, share the bulls around a little bit better. Yeah. So, so there's been lots of things that have, have worked fairly well within the system. Um, there was always a couple of challenges with uh, COVID and pickup of, of stock which had meant that some of the calves were in the sheds for a lot longer than, than was desired. What did you find was the impact on managing um, milk flow for the extra stock that are in the sheds and shed capacity, Tom? Um, yeah, we, we used up all of the cap colostrum a lot quicker um, this year. So we've, we haven't actually stored anything outside in the tanks um, this year. Um, so I think that that's helped with um, health. We've had a few loose carbs in the in the wagyu bobby shed um just so i think there's a little bit higher stocked in there because we're having to keep the the bobbies until they're 10 days old so i think the, the average age of um the wagyu is going sort of 14 days um so that that's had an impact on available cap colostrum so we've we've actually transitioned the replacement heifers onto milk powder um they're on a 50 50 mix at the moment but we'll 
uh, probably next week we'll start building them up to um, probably 75%. Yeah. Um, now that we're <laughs> almost finished carving, so. And just going back, um, Daniel was asking about the ratio of bulls to heifers with the synchro program, Tom, and what it might potentially move to. I think it worked out at 17 to 1. So, the, yeah, I think last year we were just over 20. So, um, Yeah, do you think that's enough, Daniel? Uh, we aim for sort of 1 to 15. Um, but, yeah, we don't do any synchrony either, so... Yeah, it's always a hard one to balance that. Yeah. Gracious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and pressure on the heifers too, you know, uh, with, with too, too many bulls there. So just trying to get that balance right. Yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah, I guess one to 15 to 20 is probably all right if, if you're not synchronising, but just remember when you're synchronising, the, the ones that aren't in calf, they're all going to come cycle again within a very small window within sort of maybe five or six days of each other. So the bull's going to be very, very busy yep. um, for a few days. Yeah, yeah. Um, the I'm repo team, they just mentioned, if possible, uh, as I just previously mentioned, you know, you know, that, that 20 is, is ideal, but if, if you can lay your hands on a, on, a, on, a, on a couple of extra bulls, just even for that, uh, that period again, that week period, it, it does take the pressure off because, I mean, it's... Uh, as, as we reported out, there's a large number going to come back over a very uh, short window. Yeah. yeah. Um, I'm just trying to share another screen now. I'm not sure if you can see it. Can you see a carving rate graph now? Yes. Okay, right. Let me just make that up. They just keep popping up on different screens, unfortunately, so I'm not quite sure where they're landing up. Uh, so this is, um, this is just a beautiful, colourful graph that we've put together, which is... Um, shows carving rate over time. And I think what's quite interesting about it is um, the, the blue line effectively is a cumulative graph. So that's uh, the carving rate over time, which is the 2019. In the 2020 year, we laid the start of our carving due to the availability of the sex semen program. Um, and so we, of course, had a bit of a later start um, and then we're able to sort of accumulate, um, accumulate back um, oh, I'll just scroll up a little bit so you can see that top part. A bit smaller. There you go. Um, and then we've got the, uh, the 2021 year. And so, of course, the red line, which is tracking along here, started off very strong because we brought forward the plan starter carving uh, back to our normal time and also had the heifers carving a bit earlier, um, we had a really low, well, not a really low, well, yes, it was a low six week in calf rate of, of 65% compared to the year prior. Um, it was a bit of a result of, of a multitude of, of things. Um, and we did primarily find that we had some challenges with, with feed quality going into um, sort of like that second round of mating. Cows got back in calf later on, but we had quite a lot of um, early losses. Uh, you can see that we've while we've been tracking behind, uh, over time, we've only just started to catch up now, and we are now back ahead to where we were on the 2019 season. So um, it has changed our carving rate profile, eh, Tom? And, and we do, you do notice it on a workload basis, but also around um, having demand and milk solids supplied in the early part of the season, probably um, so, sort of during that July period. Do you want yeah. to comment on that a little bit about how the, the change in our breeding plan has uh, changed the, the carving um Cumulative carving rate. Um, I'll try. Um, it's just yeah. You know, I, I said last week. Yeah, you know, the way to describe this carving has just been it's been very steady. Um, we've had a few good days and then a few quiet days, but um, on average, you know, we're just picking up five a day, and um, you know, we've we've come out the other end, all right. But um, yeah, you know, the cows are just really well, but it's not been front really front loaded. Um, and I think that's that's reflected in that six week in calf rate. Um, if if we could boost our conception rate, it would be really good. Yeah, um, we've been sitting around that um, forty eight to fifty percent for the last few years. Yeah. And so some changes with um, a couple of things we did change with the sex semen is that we weren't using any 
um, why weight or synchrony programs on those yep. cows for starters, just to ensure that we were uh, that was recommended best practice, wasn't it, Neville, in relation to to using sex semen? Yeah, I think we you get your best results. So I thought it, it seems to be I call it the natural way. I don't know why weight, not necessarily not unnatural, but just normal cycling seems to get the best results. So when you're paying, you know, that's sixty two fifty. Uh, you know, it's about putting the odds in in, in your favour. Yeah. Uh, and bearing in mind too, I think you, you, you you've been very selective around the animals you have put up to um, sex semen, and that also so you you want to make sure you're getting the best results you possibly can when you are inseminating them. Yeah, and and the other one would be uh, the gestation length period uh, moving away from uh, as much SGL being used and using um, alternative beef breeds. So. I don't know whether Neville, you wanted to comment on that, or, or Tom, in relation to how that potentially impacts on the the carbon rate. Yeah, well, I was just sitting here just thinking about that actually, and in two thousand nineteen, if I remember rightly, there was no wagyu used, so potentially in theory, that's cost you sixteen days per um, uh, pregnancy. And how I come to that conclusion is based on the standard is so the short the short gestation you're gain, gaining ten days. And we do know the Wagyu was about six days longer. So that's, that's how I've come to that, that, that conclusion. Uh, so it, you know, it has had a significant impact uh, in terms of your days of milk, and which I think has been reflected in, in, you know, uh, in, in the, uh, the, or part of the, been, been reflected in the graph here as well. Yeah. Yeah. And it, yeah, it's, um, it's a real tension point between um, the story of reducing bobbies and, and days in milk. Um, we know we know that the short gestation will get us around that extra ten days, but um, we've just got to balance it with our no bobby story. Yeah, and I guess it, it does have flow on implications. Once you know and can plan for it, then it does impact on things like feed budgets mm -hmm. um, and how you plan throughout that season. So, like Tom said, it's it's been a relatively uh, uh, consistent, smoother carving, but it also has meant that there probably hasn't been as much pressure on feed supply. So it's just about being able to plan for that um, in relation to your feed planning situation. Um, but I mean, last year we still did, you know, 178,000 kilos of milk solids versus what, 168, was it the, the year prior? So the delay in the calving rate didn't have a huge long-term impact on us. Uh, weather and the climate is still a bigger driver to our total production at this stage. So it just depends how much further we're prepared to go on on a, a delayed carbon rate and that early season production um, versus trying to achieve the goal of 100% purpose for lives. And that's sort of where we're at a bit of a, a tension point now. Yeah. And Neville, you, you mentioned about being selective um, on the cows you use as sex semen and trying to maximise the conception rate. Do you want to expand on that? So what, what do you mean by being selective which cows you use? Are these... I assume that the cows you're 100 percent positive are in heat, or cows yep. are pre-mating heats, so they're more fertile. Um, is, is that what you're talking about? Yeah, there's two things to what well, one was, but we are possible making sure they had a heat prior to with the conception rate. And the other thing was too also was that uh, memory Tom thing, but we, we only made it the top 50 percent, so we put a real pressure on the actual number of selection of cows coming up replacements because one of the aims and it was achieved here. All replacements were in the first within, within 24 days. That, or that was the uh, main length for replacements. So yeah. you want to make sure you give yourself the best opportunity, both from a, around the conception rate to get the sex semen, because it's uh, it's it. Um, it's it's um, on theory, it, it wasn't risky, but you know, it, it, but in terms of re re reality, when you're going to actually do it on an operational level, there was a certain uh, a potential. Uh, risk and they're not getting enough replacements, but as it turned out, we got bang on what we anticipated. So that's just what I meant by that comment, uh, Frank. Yeah. Yeah, no, I think just squeezing that um, replacement um, period, we you know we just weighed the cars for the first time today, and they're seventy kilos, and they were seventy three kilos on the thirtieth of September last year, just because of the the spread. Um, obviously, the the earlier ones were. Um, yeah, the same weight as what the early ones were this year, but just because we had that spread, we're, we're already um, 20 days ahead. So um, hopefully that translates into being able to wean them a little bit earlier this year. Yeah. 
And one of the key things that, that does link into is a reduced replacement rate. So we're aiming for a 21% replacement rate in order to reduce both, I guess, our environmental footprint through methane emissions um, primarily. Um, and so by being able to have a, a, a tighter mob uh, well growing means they will hopefully have a better health and repro success and we can then maintain that replacement rate and still achieve the BW gains that we need to get the efficiency. So kind of all linked together a little bit um, and so we're trying to get as much gain as we can out of the breeding program and other areas of farm performance as well. Now I noticed that you're in the room here today, um, sorry to kind of put you on the spot but if you're listening to us, just wondering if you would be prepared to frame up a little bit about um, where the industry is heading with uh, this whole area around purposeful breeding objectives um, and we can have a bit of a chat about the future as well. Hi, I'm Odette I'm from Darien Z. I'm doing my master's in reducing bobby calves. I'm looking at dairy trust Taranaki farms, um, similar aspects, design mating programs, completely all AI for the first year. So that's what my master's is looking at specifically. And then Darien Z has a wider um, project as well that's um, very much looking into the reduction of bobby calves. It's a big key um, focus point for Dairy and Z. So that's run by Ina um, and she's looking at overseas internationally what's going on and what needs to be done um, in New Zealand to be able to um, cater for that. So she can speak a little bit better to it what I can. So just bear with me. But um, so that's like looking at doing um, market. There's a big yearly plan that she's laid out um, into doing market research and having partner farms um, and seeing how reducing bobbies plays out on the partner farms, much like our farm. Um, what else is she doing? Uh, there's other wider research that they might look into as well. Um, and do you want a bit more than that? No, I, I guess the key thing is that we, um, knowing that there is uh, momentum coming in relation to different strategies, um, bodies of work and, and support from the dairy industry around what the pathways may look like, because uh, when we sat down and designed a mating plan for this year going forward, we, it was, we could not find the next big leap for us to get the same sort of gains that we've been able to make in the past. And there's been a couple of things that are driving that. One is that the, the Wagyu contract is probably not gonna hold as strong uh, payout wise for us in future years. It doesn't mean to say it's um, any less palatable for us because it's still, a, it's still a profitable option and still allows us to achieve our targets. But there may be some alternative beef breeds that are looking a little bit more um, desirable in the market. Um, I know Daniel, you use the Charolais in, as, a, as a method, don't you, for your reducing your bobby calves? Uh, so yeah, we've done the Wagyu contracts as well, as well. Um, but yeah, we tried some Charolais this year. I'm currently talking to, oh, there's someone local that's after 100 to 150 Charolais calves, sort of contract that forward. Um, yeah, just to try and partner up, I guess, like you suggested. And, yeah, and that's kind of where we see the next step is that for us, we either need to start securing um, land or securing partnerships where we share some of the risk and the end value for that, um, that calf. And so uh, part of forming that partnership is then finding what's the correct breeding attributes that we need for those calves. Uh, the other option is to look at where the most efficient calves are coming from and some of the progress that might be made on uh, efficiency of live weight gains. And I understand that some of the breeding companies are also exploring uh, the equivalent of that W type of um, value for uh, uh, dairy cross calves. Uh, that one of the benefits of having a high BW herd is that they're high converters of feed into protein. So um, if that can translate into an efficient uh, calf, then that would be, um, would, you know, that would be an advantageous to us as well. So I don't know, Neville, whether you wanted to comment on um, where that's sort of heading. Yeah, well, we've actually sort of, uh, LIC, you know, like a term, um BW, um, we've created what we call a beef index, and it's 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 it's, it's both um, dairy focused and um, beef industry focused. And with dairy focused things like calving ease, for example, come are part of it. It's uh, and birth weight etc., which is very and then 
uh, uh, we're looking at uh, yeah, weight gain, etc. From a finisher's point of view, and being on measuring, you know, marbling and, and and what it actually looks like is, is finally slaughtered. So it's in its early stages yet, but sort of just working that kind of through to get to get an animal that's that suits both um, yeah the beef industry and for, 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 for people on this uh, um, uh, phone call the, the dairy industry. I think the challenge basically is what you you talk about here with our farm and what I'm still seeing in my role is that. Uh, at the moment, it's very fragmented. Everyone's sort of working in their own little, uh, I always say world, but just chipping away at it. I mean, 30,000 Wagyu's ain't going to solve the problem of, God, say, throw it up, uh, figure out they have 2 million bobbies. Uh, and a lot of individuals have got their own little contracts going, but it, it is a, a bigger issue than that. And, and I mean, I think it's probably the challenge is going to be is to find a market um, that can, you know, swallow up a, a, a decent chunk of that, um, the, of, of, of what we currently seen as bobbies in, in one leap. Um, the other thing, I think, just what we're, what we're as, as an organisation we're dealing with, as I say, is looking at the breeds, looking at the, at the opportunities. I mean, uh, someone mentioned Charolais before. Uh, the, the, uh, Beef and Lamb had that trial, what, three years ago, and the outstanding performer there was a bull called Jerry, which was actually a Charolais. Um, so, so I mean, probably a few years ago, it was a breed that you probably uh, were a little hesitant about putting across your animal. So, this is coming through, but it's just finding that ideal breed, ideal animal for the industry. But also, the other most important thing I think, is, is to find a market for these calves. Yeah. Does anyone else want to share um, their strategy? Like Tom and I are, are, are learning from others as well along the, the journey. Um, about your journey to start working towards more purposeful lives for calves and the progress that you've made and some of the steps that you've done towards it. Anybody got any to share? No? Cool, that's all right. We'll keep, we'll keep on learning. There are lots of people out there that um, have been able to reduce bobby calves to zero um, already, but most of them have uh, associated block of land in which they have a lot more flexibility in um, the end product and the timing of the sale of those those stocks. So um, that's something that is, it, it is an option for some, but we're actually looking for uh, options and solutions that are transferable to the majority of dairy farmers as a way to move forward. So um, yeah, cool. Okay, so um, any other further questions about the mating plan? Um, actually, before we just wrap up with Tom talking about what his next fo his focus is to get things right for mate this coming mating. No? Okay, so Tom, over the next couple of weeks, you have started your pre-mating uh, tail painting to, to observe these cows. So what's the standard practice there? Is it three weeks pre-mating observations? And then what will you... Oh, actually start before that. You've done your metric checking and your metric curing, haven't you, already? Yeah, so we've done two lots of metric checking um, about three weeks apart. Um, COVID kind of made the second one four weeks. Um, and then I've got... Uh, third lots ready to do um, the day after we start mating. Um, so we start on the 22nd, so not far away. Um, uh, I've, yeah, I've obviously doing my pre-mating um, heats. I'll do four weeks of that. And then that will um, give me a group of cows that are non-cyclers and then we'll have a look at them with the vets and if they are eligible. So they're you know, in good condition condition and the uh they've been carved more than 42 days and we'll, we can use a cedar on those um but yeah very similar to last year i think yep and a couple of other things to prepare of course one was uh, making sure that body condition score was right and also making sure you've got feed ahead of the cows going into mating so um body condition score carried out uh, prior to carving and then also just before mating so last <laughs> week well i think first of september was the last body condition school were you happy with the condition of the cows yeah really happy oh, i was really surprised so um i was very happy um i yeah i thought they'd um done it a bit tough in early august but they've um yeah come through really well and i've got a handful on on one today um younger girls or a couple of that are just getting over a few health issues um but yeah we're we're 4.8 so i'm really stoked with that 
Yeah, and so you've used that data to prioritise cows that were at risk either by losing too much weight or hitting below that sort of four condition. And so those yep. cows all have an action associated with them, whether they go into the second herd or whether they get milk once a day to help um, make sure that they are sort of turning around and start to put on weight. So getting the cows in the right condition, making sure that they are at, they've sort of stopped losing weight and are, are potentially start to put it on is, is one of those priority areas and what about making sure you've got enough feed ahead of the cows for, for mating what's your big strategy there yeah like like we said last year we uh, last week we you know do our weekly farm walk and we make our plans according to that so I've, I've sped up from a 30 down to a 22 day round um that should should settle down to be between that 22 and 24 days um i've got lots of different size paddocks so it's um not always um, perfect each week but <coughs> Um, yeah, we're we're sitting comfortably. Um, what is it, twenty one fifty? So plenty of feed ahead. Um, any longer grass, and it's most likely it'll end up in the stack. Which um, you know, I've planned some silage for the end of the month to tie in the annuals with um, going into crop. Um, so they'll be sprayed out some time around the twentieth, the week, the week that we start mating, really. Yeah, so just being able to plan ahead, knowing that we do lose, um, you know, 11 hectares uh, as part of our brassica strategy, and we need to be able to um, plan for that as well, make sure there's no undue pressure on the yeah. cows. And, and um, the area, well, it's actually 17 hectares because we'll lose some area going into chicory for the for the calves oh. over summer too. So. Runoff area, yeah. Yep. Yep. Um, making, and, yeah, make sure we've got enough cover on the remaining um, 130 hectares. And for those um, who are interested in technology for heat detection too, uh, Drew NZ's running their Zoom tonight, Frank, on um, the pros and cons of using heat detection technology. So if, if that's something that you're interested in, uh, make sure you jump on there tonight at, at 7 o'clock um, via Zoom or Facebook Live for that event as well. Um, okay, so uh, we've just got time for, if there's any last questions, either to do with the sort of weekly information or to do with sort of uh, the mating plan and the results to date around that, that we haven't been able to address for you? Just just around heat detection, Tom, like you're doing your pre mating heats now um, and you're not using any bulls, so you've got quite a long time um, with heat detection. How does how, the heat detection actually run? Is it just you doing it yourself? Does it spread between uh, the path? Are you using um, any aids? Um, Cause yeah. Uh, yeah, just tail, tail paint and patches um, and then yeah, Lani and I do it. Um, having projects made a lot easier. Um, find it's easier to pay attention to draft them while I'm milking rather than standing there waiting for the bull and cow to come around um, and get distracted. Um, so yeah, twice, twice or three times a week, depending on how many cows are bulling, I'll, I'll stand on the cups offside and yeah, touch up the paint or reapply patches. Um, but as as mating goes along, then um, I can do that while I'm milking as well. So. Um, yeah. yeah. Are you doing paddock checks or just at the cow shed? Um, um, ever, I'll, I'll have a ride around cowboy. and see, um, yeah, just, just out of interest, but I tend not to write the numbers down because I'll, I'm, I'm there in the morning anyway, writing them down um, or drafting them. So, yeah, I, I don't think it adds, adds a lot. I think it complicates things um, because I'm, I'm then looking for a specific cow's number and I might miss something else. Um, yeah. yeah. And what, what about, like, if, you, if you're away, if you have weekends off or, or don't you have... Yeah, La La Lani, Lani takes over and, yeah, she, she, she does go for a ride around, same as I do, and just, um, yeah, then, she, then she's aware of, um, one, how many she's looking for, but, um, yeah, specific cows as well, so. But yeah, it is it is a long, long sort of sixteen weeks of um, looking at um, tail paint. Um, <laughs> but yeah, cremated um, heats. Are you looking at looking at that every day for cremated heats, or just every couple of days? Uh, for pre mating. Yeah. I just yeah, just do it once a week. Once a week, yeah. Yeah. So we look forward to seeing the results from tonight's uh, presentation about which might be the most effective technology to use. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Okay. So if there's no more questions, we can probably close up Zoom. Any last questions? 
No, uh, don't forget. So next Wednesday, we have got our focus day presentation. So um, it's all about data and the Wagwheel KPI. So if you're into data and want to see um, the annual results in relation to the KPI. So we've just talked about, you know, one of those areas for us is around, you know, purposeful breeding objectives. We will be talking about all the other areas of our wagon wheel and how we've performed against those. So um, same sort of thing. It'll be a 11 o'clock session. Uh, tune in there to find out more. We'll be releasing the, um, the documents or the handout prior to that. Uh, and then the following two Wednesdays, we'll also have a couple of weekly catch-up sessions as well. So feel free to join us at another time. Um, it was lovely to have you here today. And um, yeah, enjoy the rest of the week. Thanks for coming. Thanks to Neville um, and to Frank as well for your contribution as always. And uh, cheers, Tom. You're doing a great job. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Thank you all. Thank you. See ya. Bye -bye.